Saturday morning and a great time to get ready to garden. And so we are ready for you here at Maryfield's Gardening Advisor because we've got some great ideas for you today. It's time to get started. And what's a perfect way to start? Well, the best way to start this house is going to be growing plants from seed. Uh, because we do want to get a little bit of a head start on that. We've got a huge selection of seeds in stock and available. And I'm sure you gardeners have been getting catalogs at home, so we're going to go through this whole thing today uh, looking at basically selecting seeds, you know, how to start them, how to grow them, some of the different options, little tips on uh, how to do it and also ideas on what you can grow. So lots of good information That's today. That's great. It's a, it's a fun time and our amazing selection of seeds. You can just kind of get lost in, in there just deciding what to, what to pick. Yes. Well, that is one of the hardest parts of the whole process. Well, you know, something has to be hard. Something has to be hard because gardening is fun and gardening is easy. Uh, we've also got it, you know, the 1st of March is always exciting at the Garden Center because everything is starting to come in. Everything is fresh and new. So we've got shipments this week. We've got roses, which we'll talk about a little bit later. We've got pansies. We've got primroses. We've got hellebores. Got first delivery of trees coming oh, in, wow. fruit trees, uh, a lot of shade trees. So yeah, it's it's we're getting stocked up it and is. ready. It's fun to see those beds get filled up. You know, you, you look out all winter and there's nothing out there. It's like, all right. Yeah. Here. So you definitely need to come in and check that out for yourself because it is great when you see it just suddenly everything shows up. Absolutely. Well, to, and help, to help us get started, we've got great ideas at our gardening seminar. So it's a perfect way to learn more about gardening. So that's something else you can do to begin the season. So this weekend, as we have the last few weeks and will through the end of April, we've got our great seminars at our Maryfield location today. We've got Garden Design, and that's with Karen Rexroad, one of our wonderful plant specialists. And she's going to show you the importance of flow and impact of a few visually weighted plants that draw the eye. So that's just a little hint, but you know, all kinds of things she's going to be talking about. 10 o'clock at our, at our Maryfield location. It's at the Maryfield Community Hall, which is right next door. At our Fair Oaks today, location today, Professor Larry's here, right? Yeah, now he's going to be talking about pruning, you know, the basics of pruning, which uh, is always a really hugely popular class. I know we've talked about that a little bit on the TV show. What is kind of neat is if you come to this class, uh, he shows you and demonstrates, but he's also got things set up to take you outside and under our greenhouse so it's going to be comfortable. I know it's a little chilly out today, but he actually sets, you know, brings trees up and shows you on actual specimens and plants how to do this. So it's a little bit of a hands-on opportunity. So it's, a, it's fantastic. Uh, like I said, it draws a big crowd. So try to get there a few minutes early. Make sure you get a good seat. Absolutely. And at our Gainesville location, this is fun, uh, Regina Langto is going to be talking about terrariums. Now she's been doing several little in-house seminars on those, uh, or workshops I guess, uh, hands-on type things. So this is a, a great way to, to do a, a fun project indoors. Uh, they're not going to be making anything there, but she's going to show you what, everything you need to know. So that's at 10 a.m. at the Gainesville location. And I think there's a special terrarium on uh, display? I do. I have a special interest there. Now she, um, she has several terrariums, different styles and different types to show you. But at one time, years ago, she had made one that was an underwater mm -hmm. terrarium. And it had little divers and treasure chests and things. And somehow I just got to talk about there. I said, Regina, you need to do that again, but you know, I'd love to see you do one with a SpongeBob. Right. <laughs> you know, SpongeBob living under the sea and stuff. <laughs> so she went out and she actually found the little figures, oh, um, wow. the little Cute. Lego figures, and has made a special edition at my request, SpongeBob <laughs> Terrarium. Uh, so that's going to be on display down there, and I hope everybody will check that out. Use your imagination a little bit and think as though you're in his underwater world. That is super, super, super. Well, coming up next week, we have three more great seminars Gardening in Small Spaces rare and underused perennials, and landscape do's and don'ts. So as always, you can stop by uh, any of our locations, pick up a copy of the seminar schedule, or, or go to our website, as you can see at the bottom there, maryfieldgardencenter.com, and they're all listed there. A so. couple other quick announcements. Um, now that spring is here and it's lighter longer, our hours are shifting a little bit at Maryfield Garden Center. Um, and for the next couple of weeks till time changes, we'll be open till dark. So, you know, a little, long, little later than the 6, 6 o'clock that we have been open all winter during the week. And on Sundays, we'll be open till 6 now because it's, it's nice and bright until after 6 now. Yeah, I tell you, that's the thing, the short days are what depresses me about wintertime and having the days get longer, a little more time to do things after work if mm -hmm. you're 
can. It, it really, you feel like spring's on the way, and I sure enjoy this time of year. Absolutely. And one more quick thing. This is a save the date. I uh, wanted to put, have you put this on your calendar. March 23rd and 24th, we're going to, at all three locations, going to have like a little a spring gardening celebration. Just a fun day. We're going to have some appetizers, and, and we'll have our seminars. We'll have experts around. So put that on your calendar. We'll have more information on that coming up. But just wanted to let you know about that. So I think that's all of our, some, our announcements for today. Good. Well, one of the things I wanted to start out talking about this morning is not seed starting, but I want to talk a little bit about moss. And I say that because I've been getting any number of customers coming in the store with samples. Uh, we've been getting some email requests, just lots of questions about you know what to do with moss that's growing in the lawn. So that um, as the days are getting a little milder and with some of these rain showers, we're seeing that show up. So I'll start just the picture. Uh, now everybody's seen moss before, but uh, this little picture from my yard, I love moss. I mean, I, actually, I, I think it makes a nice sort of emerald green ground cover, very naturalized and stuff. So I was able to go out and take this picture in my garden where I'm actually trying to encourage it and promote it. And I've got this little patch and it just, it's taking its time, but it can't spread fast enough. But most of the time, what I'm encountering from people is where this is growing out in their lawn areas and people are trying to figure out how to discourage it. How can I get rid of moss? Well, I'd like to say that there are a lot of myths that are out there regarding moss. Uh, you'll hear people all the time saying, oh, I have moss in the lawn, I need to apply lime. That's probably the most frequent thing that I hear. And it's just not true. Moss can grow under a pH of four, moss can grow under a pH of five. So it is not always directly associated with your soil pH. I think what we need to understand is that moss is a primitive plant. It does not have a vascular system like higher plants do. It doesn't have that root system. It doesn't flower and reproduce by seed. It has different mechanisms. Moss, because it doesn't necessarily grow um, a root system, moss can grow on rocks. It can grow on very hard, compact surfaces. And most of the time, what I find when you have moss growing in your lawn is because that, um, that soil is very dense, it's very compacted, and water doesn't infiltrate into the ground, so that it tends to stay damp and it has that moisture sitting on the surface of the ground. And moss does have to have water. It has to have a moist environment. So it's dense, compacted soils that don't allow air and water to infiltrate, that's frequently under shade, so it tends to retain that moisture. And when you have that environment, you're going to have moss. At the same time, it's difficult for grass to grow in there. So moss, it's not, it's not a real quick, easy answer to that question. Now you can start by using uh, moss out. Now uh, there's several different products. This is the one that I found to be most effective. This is a moss killer that you can put on as a granule. You would apply while the, the ground is damp so that, that, um, that you put the granule down while it's damp and then lightly water it in afterwards. And this does kill the moss quickly and effectively, usually within a few days of putting this down. So then after all that moss has turned brown, uh, you can go in there, kind of rake it out heavily, and then come back and start to reseed and repair your lawn. Now in the long term, big scheme of things, you need to work to improve the soil drainage. You want to build and improve the soil structure. Anything you can get some sunlight in there, anything that enhances the drainage to kind of dry the area out a little bit will be a longer term answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you have a couple of quick pictures we were going to show? Right no, I've already showed them. Just okay. had the one picture of the moss and okay. I figure, hey, That's everybody's right. seen moss. I'm getting ahead so of myself. We'll go with that. <laughs> right. Okay. I guess that means we should take a break. Unless you want to see the mo my moss patch again. That's okay. That's all right. Okay. No. Tempting, but. But really, it's beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Some people, if you've got a dense, poorly drained area, moss can make a nice ground cover, but if it's disturbing your lawn, then try the moss out. Great. Okay. We'll take a break, a break and be right back. Welcome back. We're talking about seed starting today, and David, you've brought all, all kinds of things over, some seeds, some supplies, and what do we need to do to get started? You did. Well, it's, it's a fantastic thing to do. I, I say this is fun for the whole family. Uh, you never, never, no matter how many years you've been gardening, get tired of watching seeds go these little tiny, sometimes a speck of this piece of 
speck of pepper and watching that sprout, watching it grow, you nurture, you care for it and bring it all the way to where then you have these beautiful flowers in your garden or vegetables. So it's really just a rewarding thing uh, to do. But in addition to this, I think one of the biggest reasons I like to grow my own plants from seed is you get this huge selection. Like we were talking about, mm -hmm. you know, in our store at Merrifield Garden Center, we actually represent about six different seed vendors. So I know you might be receiving a catalog, but imagine if you had six different catalogs you're working with. That's basically what we have to offer. So we've got seeds coming in from Ferry Morse, from Lake Valley, uh, from Livingston, Burpee, Botanical Interest. These are names of just different seed suppliers. And so with that, you know, you get this big selection uh, that we're showing these different flowers, vegetables, herbs, you know, just anything you can think of. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that's nice is a lot of times people have an interest, let's say, in growing heirloom varieties. Heirloom varieties are these old varieties been passed down hand to hand for generations. They're open pollinated. Uh, they may not lend themselves as well to market production, right. but for the home gardener, they can be excellent with exceptional uh, flavor and taste to it. There might be things like people want to grow organic. Uh, a lot of these companies now are also offering organic options mm -hmm. that are in there. And then there's also unusual varieties. I brought things in uh, just like a, a purple tomatillo. Ah. Um, I don't know, I've never grown it. Uh -huh. I don't know why you'd want to, but maybe Maybe you want to make a purple salsa. There you go. Out of it. Uh, there are things in here I brought in like this Asian long bean, mm -hmm. just to show. These are just random examples that I, I pulled off the shelf. Uh, again, to show it might be a matter of culinary preference. We have seeds that come from Italy. Mm -hmm. So there's all these particular varieties that uh, go in. I just, uh, nice garden bean there, just to show that there's organic seeds that are available. Uh, all kinds of greens. Another one that I just want to show is this is really, because um, this is new for us, mm -hmm. uh, but the microgreens, which have been so popular, people using in their salad mixes. Oh. So, uh, so you can come in and buy these collections where they're already pre-mixed and everything. And here is a oh, microgreen What a great collection. idea. Exactly. Now, you were mentioning to me, David, a, a tomato that you grew that you really can't buy in the stores because the, the skin is not... Exactly. And I, I like to experiment. Now, mm -hmm. when I had a bigger garden, I could grow more varieties. Right. But now I'm limited. But I was saying how, like, last year I grew one that's mm -hmm. called Black Crim. Uh, it's kind of a smaller old heirloom table. To me, but like I said, it's so soft and the mm -hmm. skin's so thin that if you were trying to ship this and move it through the marketplace, it'd be bruised and cracked and split. But as a home garden vegetable, uh, it does quite well and a very, very wonderful flavor to it. So, again, these are just well, some of the many reasons that you'd want to grow your own. Now, the other part of this, along with after you said choosing your mm -hmm. seeds, selecting what you want to grow may often be the most difficult part of the process. Right. <laughs> and of course, this goes for flowers and annuals and stuff. But there's some other supplies you're going to need to go along with that. Um, you will need a seed starting mix. Now, these mixtures, they've been developed specifically for germinating the mm -hmm. seeds, so they're screened to a finer texture than a regular potting mix is, and it's going to hold that right balance of moisture. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like, like a sponge. Where it's not, uh, right, not, so you, it's going to glare it's gonna be, at us, um, I think. Right. <laughs> it, it's going to have the right balance of air Show space the there, so as well as the there. right balance of mm -hmm. moisture holding capacity. Yeah. So, And this is just one, this is the Jiffy brand, but there's there's several varieties. All right, we, we carry from mm -hmm. a Spoma Pro Mix, you know, and it's it. they're all good. It just comes down to which size. I brought the small package right. in, Easier but to handle if you're doing camera. a lot of seed starting, <laughs> you might want to go even something like Pro Mix, which comes in a big right. bag. So right. mm -hmm. we, we, again, we, we have options that are out there. Mm -hmm. You're also going to need some type of container, obviously, to grow them in. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, there's lots of choices that go on there. Anywhere from things like these little peat pots uh, they're showing up in here. Uh, so these are little pots that um, they're, they degrade over time. Uh, these I love too. Yeah, the Jiffy 7 Jiffy pellets. <laughs> it looks yeah. like just a little disc and you put it in water. Here you go. Yeah, I'm going to put this out in the front of the desk. I took one and I soaked it in water this morning. Uh, and so you can see it starts out as that compressed disc. It's mm -hmm. already filled with uh, peat moss. Of that. 
and then they swell up and it's got a little planting hole that you can see directly into there. Great. So that's really convenient. And these even come in these little kits, uh, like I'm trying right. to show here. Okay, so we may, um, may, I guess we may not be able to get a kit. Which something like that. that, which shows that it has the peat pellets, it's got the little tray, the dome that goes mm -hmm. over it, everything included in these there. Are, these are just amazing to me, how, huh? you know. I guess seven, Jiffy Seven, because it's seven times the, there we go. The, the size. So here you can see right. what it looks like. So, this is the original. Yeah, and that's just individually. And like mm -hmm. I said, there's also kits that are available. Uh, so bottom line, I'm trying to say is again, we have uh, big selections there. Mm -hmm. So you go through, make your selections. It's there, and then we're about ready to get started. But I got a couple pictures I wanted to use okay. sort of finish mm -hmm. this off. Uh, so the idea is, you know, you've got your potting mix. You know, you basically you have, um, you know, you've selected your potting mix, your containers, mm -hmm. your seeds, put all that together. And one of the things we're talking about is getting a head start by growing them indoors. So you could, a couple different ways you can do this. If you don't have a lot of room or space available, this is where I put all my little seedlings into a tray. And when they get to about this size, I gently, carefully lift them out of that tray and then put them into individual pots. or is our next picture showing if you have the um, availability of space and room to work with you can sow your seeds directly into the tray or directly into the little pots itself so either way works you just kind of adapt and work with this based on what kind of space and room and lighting and things like that that you have available Great. okay so this will get you started so we've got some more information for you when we return We're back and we're talking about seed starting. So we talked about the selection. We talked about some of the supplies that you'll need. What's next? Well, I think this is one of the most important parts in places where people go wrong really mm -hmm. comes down to the proper timing. Uh, I'm always talking about this like that the, the timing and the scheduling is everything. It makes a difference between success and failure in your gardening. And this is very true also with seeding plants. Now there's a couple different ways. Um, when I talk about direct sowing, Direct sowing is, hey, I buy a package of seeds, I go out, you know, I turn the soil up, I make sure the soil's nice and well prepared, plant them directly in my garden, and wait for things to grow. And that's a, a really great, easy, efficient way to do it. Um, the problem, I might say, or one of the things you have to realize is also the amount of time that that takes. For example, if I want to talk about frost-tolerant plants, these are plants that grow during cooler weather, can tolerate a light frost. Uh, they can get started, they can be planted directly out into the soil, in your ground, even before um, spring is really here. So if I say our average frost date for most of us is somewhere between April 20 and April 30, depending on where you live, uh, cool season plants you could actually sow directly in the ground even a, f a couple weeks before that frost date comes. So I just have uh, one picture to show you an example of peas that are sprouting. Um, peas are one of the plants that can really tolerate the cold soil. You can plant them out there even in late March. I'm gonna say to me it's still a little bit early. Some people are trying and you know we're all trying to guess what the weather's doing. Right. So <laughs> if, if you want to try, go ahead and do it. Um, but these are things that I think really would be planted directly into the soil probably towards late March. Okay. Now, you really cannot put warm season plants out there. When I'm talking cool season things, like peas, carrots, lettuce, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, you know, things like that. Um, but if you want to grow, for example, if you're trying to grow tomatoes, peppers, corn, beans, those plants need to go into warmer soil. You cannot put them out there at this time of year. Those plants you actually have to wait until after frost. So we're talking late April or May time period to actually seed them in the ground. Now, what happens, most gardeners a lot of times want to get a head start on that. Let's say I want to grow, uh, you know, I'm going to use tomatoes as an example. That's the most popular one. I just finished telling you that you have to wait until May to plant them. Well, then I'm waiting till September to pick a tomato. 
So we can get a jump on that. We can get a head start on that by growing our seeds indoors. And that's where we're talking about the seed starter, the trays, the pots, all that kind of thing. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to start them about four to six weeks earlier indoors. So if my goal is to put them out on the 1st of May, that means I want to start my seeds probably sometime in the middle part of March. That's why we're having the show today. Mm -hmm. So you, a lot of your seed starting on warm season crops like tomatoes and peppers and everything are going to be sort of the middle, later part of March. If you want to grow cool season vegetables like lettuce and cabbage and cauliflower, you can even start that now indoors. Okay, and our average frost date again? Somewhere between April 20 and April okay. 30, and again, that depends a little bit on where you live. Right. Exactly. If you're closer in towards the district, uh, then we're probably talking about more like um, late a or early April 20, I'm right. getting myself right. tongue tied. <laughs> if you grow further west, then it might be um, more like April 30th. Gotcha. Okay. Um, now you need to check on them on a daily basis to see that everything's moist. I'm looking at my little humidity tray. Um, so imagine this as being seeds in there or little seedlings that are in there. Mm -hmm. um, but if all your seeds are growing in there, if you put this little tray over this, you've created a mini greenhouse. That kind of helps conserve moisture in there and reduces the amount of watering. So when I do this, I like to check on them daily, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you necessarily need to water them daily. And I do prefer to use a mister, something like this, for, for watering those seedlings. Uh, this way you're not knocking them all over the place because right, there's just little tiny babies mm -hmm. coming up. <laughs> so you go in there and mist them just enough to keep it damp like a moist sponge. And then probably the most important thing here I'm going to talk about is the lighting. Uh, we talk about this with indoor gardening, indoor growing. Having sufficient sunlight is really the, the most limiting factor. Uh, if your seedlings get very leggy, very stretched out, very kind of weak, that's usually because they're not getting sufficient light. So you need really good, strong sunlight coming through the window. If you don't have that, be prepared to supplement with a plant light. Now I brought this in just as an example. These are one of these high efficiency, uh, low energy use fluorescent tubes that are out there. They come in various different sizes and and lengths, this is a 36 inch long, we got them longer and shorter. Mm -hmm. This is a great uh, way to provide light for your seedlings uh, because it doesn't generate a lot of heat. You can put it down really close to those plants and you do want to have it within a couple of inches. Right. And the other is I think it should be left on for anywhere from about 12 to 14 hours a day. Uh, so what we have to do is provide good light. So we're making sure we've got you know, a good seed starter, you mm -hmm. plant them up, keep them moist, keep the light on good and then usually it's about oh six eight weeks later voila, voila. <laughs> you have your little baby plants Aww. and at this point they're ready to move outdoors okay that's the other thing I want to talk about real quickly before we go to break okay. is actually making that transition from your indoor environment to the outdoors mm -hmm. because these plants have been growing inside in a sheltered protected environment and you're ready to put them out into the cold or out into the bright sun. Right. So this means basically they need to be acclimated. They need to be what we call hardened off. So you gradually introduce, maybe you put them out where they get a couple, three hours of sun, then, a, then you increase that to about four or five hours of sun, then mm -hmm. you put them out to full day sun to avoid them getting sunburn. You keep them protected from real windy conditions so they get adapted to that door environment and then plant them out in the garden. Okay. Now another way to do that, and I've got a picture here to show, is to put up some type of protector, uh, which could be like a little mini greenhouse, or in this case I'm showing the, that wall of water. Uh, the wall of water is basically like a mini greenhouse. They're set up early, they're set up at this time of year. Uh, you fill them with water. The, as that water generally warms up and retains the warmth and the heat of the sun, it starts to warm the soil up and then this allows you to get some tender plants out there ahead of time. So you can see where we set the wall of water up, put the tomato plants in there, uh, and you leave them in place all year and they just grow right up through there. So there are these little tricks you can do to get your plants ready to go outside. These wall of water have been, been around outside. forever. I remember you know, first coming back to the nursery out of school and the, the wall of water being there. So it was, you know. 
We I've been around, years ago. but I, I still show them because they're fun. You know, it's, I know, it's, they're a, great. it's not the easiest thing to work with. You know, right. you got water, you're out there, you're kind of splashing <laughs> around and stuff. But um, but they're a lot of fun, is and I think it's a great way to engage kids in Absolutely. gardening too. And they work. Mm -hmm. They really they do, do work. They do. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with more information. Hey, welcome back. We're talking about seed starting. And uh, David, is there any little special super tricks or that type thing to, to make it more successful? There are. Now, there's some seeds that are, are more difficult to germinate. Mm -hmm. One that I wanted to show you is um, there's some that have very thick seed coats. If you like, this is moonflower. Uh, it's a favorite of everybody, I mean, because it, mm -hmm. it blooms at night. That's where it's named moonflower. You know, it looks like a morning glory, but mm -hmm. unfurls. It's bright and it's fragrant. But if you're able to you see that see seed, that seed has this really thick Whoops. coating that's on I there. I know I improvised with my I little know. display tray there. We Probably didn't think not this the best through. Choice. Oh, well, let me, yeah, let me but hold you can this just up see there. It. Maybe right. that's a little better. So what happens in the germination process, and it is a process, this doesn't happen just overnight. I get kids with science projects come in three days later and don't understand why they don't have plants. Right. Mm -hmm. um, first thing that needs to happen is moisture, water has to permeate that seed coat. Mm -hmm. And water breaks through, soaks through that seed coat, and then enzymes are released that start the growing process inside the seed. But some seeds, like nasturtiums and morning glories and, and these uh, moonflowers, they have that very thick, heavy seed coat. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you can do to enhance or speed up the germination is actually take a nail file and, okay. and scratch. You don't, want to, you don't want to actually break into the seed, but you want to be able to break through that seed coat or sometimes people will use sandpaper, but I've just done it with a nail okay. file because that was easy. You just want to get a little of the hardness off. Exactly. Right? Scratch mm -hmm. through some of that hardness mm -hmm. and then soak it overnight. Okay. And then plant the seeds. So that allows that moisture to get in there. So um, otherwise, I have taken seeds like this, just potted them up, and it can take weeks for them to sprout and germinate right. because it just takes that long to get through the mm -hmm. seed coat. May just set these on the table here and see if that's any yeah. any better. All right now, another one that I wanted to talk about a little bit was spinach, mm -hmm. and I've had trouble uh, sometimes getting spinach and Swiss chard to germinate. Now these can be directly sown into the soil; they'll germinate in cool soil temperatures. But I'm just saying, from my own personal experience, I was frustrated because I'd put them out there and I'd be getting like maybe 30% germination rates. Right. So what I started doing was pre-germinating the mm -hmm. seed. I'm just going to dump. Okay. these out, switch gears, and the way I say pre-germinate them is just you get a real paper towel mm -hmm. and you can sprinkle your spinach seeds out there and then get everything good and moist. You know, so if you imagine you would just kind of spritz, of course at home you'd be a little more thorough, mm -hmm. but you get everything moist and then you can just literally just go. kind of fold that up. I'll let you get a look. You'd okay. spread the seeds out a little bit more and then just fold that up inside the paper towel. You gotta make like it that? small enough to fit into the bag. Oh, okay, gotcha. Should I double it over? Oh yeah. Okay. Probably even go four times okay. over because then okay. we're gonna fit it inside a little Ziploc bag. I'm trying to make this like a hands-on exactly. demo here. Exactly, there we go. And then this basically sits into your refrigerator. Okay. Because again, these are cool season vegetables. They, this, that seed germinates best under a little bit lower temperatures. Yeah, you but you would keep that moist, check on it frequently, and usually within about a week's time, mm -hmm. you'll start to see that little baby root pop out of there. And that's the next step in the seed germination process. When you see that little baby primary root emerge, that's when you would take the seeds carefully so you don't injure it and then pot them up into, this, into the mix. Okay. So there's all kinds of little tricks you can do with that that are specific mm -hmm. to each plant. Now the other thing I want to talk about a little bit, and these aren't true seeds, but it's the right time to be planting and so on. Ooh, I wasn't prepared. Let me grab this stuff. <laughs> but would be root crops. We can be pr uh, planting things like um, onions and garlic and potatoes and things like that this time of year. So uh, with the next couple of weeks. Uh, you got this little bag uh, here. Onions. Ah, um, now, garlic. as you can see, this isn't <laughs> onions and garlic, exactly, good examples. Now, these obviously are not seeds, mm -hmm. but still they're, they're 
uh, baby bulbs, you know, baby right. plants. There's a bulb. So again, these are bulbs, but you would plant them just like you're planting seeds in the vegetable garden. So you can do cool season things like, you know, the onions and the potatoes and uh, so on. It, I'm going to say within the next couple of weeks. Uh, the way we're going to do that essentially though is to direct sow them. You don't need to start these indoors in pots or okay, anything. Okay, so I'm going to show this one as well. These are the exactly. two so potatoes. So you mm -hmm. just work the soil up, mix plenty of compost in and start planting. Mm -hmm. But same idea, you can, you have I'm this I'm going to come back selection. to the table here so we can just hold these up. Yeah, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, if you haven't grown oh. potatoes, this is one of the all greatest things potatoes. that you can grow. Exactly. <laughs> you still have the big selection that's out there, uh -huh. all these different varieties. Uh, and when you harvest a fresh potato, it's totally different than what you buy in the store. Mm -hmm. They're plump, they're juicy, and one of the easiest things to grow. We'll go quickly to okay. pictures because I see I'm running out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to show pictures of potatoes. Um, basically here they are planted out in the garden, so you stick them in the garden sometime in March, early April. They grow up. When they start to blossom like this, that's when they're what we call new potatoes. If you harvest them at this time, you get very small potatoes. But usually what I like to do is just leave them alone. They'll continue growing for several more weeks and then the plant just withers up and dies. And when that happens, it's time to make your harvest. Um, onions our next picture, kind of the same thing of, oh, no, I showed my little harvest. There's a little fingerling potatoes uh -huh. that are in there. Mm -hmm. And it's fun to dig them up, kind of like treasure hunting. Yeah. Of onions, a similar story. You would plant them early in the season. You can see this is from very early spring. These onions were actually planted in the previous fall, carried through the winter time. And you could harvest them now as greens or, or green onions are very small, but the others, uh, you leave them alone, they'll, later in the season they'll start to flower. You probably want to cut those flowers off and then, then they'll sort of flop over and that would be the time to harvest them. I uh, also have a picture in here of what's called a traveling onion or Egyptian onion, just to give you an idea of what they look like um, as they approach that bloom time. It uh, doesn't show up real well, but right there in the center is uh, them going to their flowering stage. But uh, really, you'd probably want to cut that blossom off and then harvest them about that time. Garlic, similar thing. You Garlic, you would take the entire bulb, divide that into individual cloves. The cloves are planted in the ground. Now, these are actually chives. I didn't have a picture, a good picture of garlic blooming. But garlic will flower, and it looks very much like this. Gotcha. Same okay. Beautiful flowers. They're gorgeous. But you got to be tough. you got to cut those blossoms off. And then soon after they've flowered, the, um, the greens just kind of flop over, and you know your garlic's ready to harvest. All right. Well, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we are going to take your phone calls. And we have a little something to show you first before we get started. But 703-387-1046. So we'd love to talk to you in just a couple of minutes. Here's our Zen frog there, getting ready to take the, the good vibes of the earth. <laughs> exactly. Hey, you, you could conceivably sit there and do your yoga while you're watching the that's show. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, we've actually been joined by a special guest here uh, before we get started with our phone calls. Uh, we mentioned at the beginning of the show that our uh, roses, the dormant plantable roses, have just arrived. I mean, yesterday, I believe. So, yeah. <laughs> so they are here. They are ready to go. Uh, these are the ones you can put in now. Oh, absolutely you can. Uh, basically, this is a great time to be planting any time between, I'd say now and mid-April. We hope that uh, by that time we're moving into the mm -hmm. actively growing roses. But the thing is, again, you buy them now while they're in their dormant uh, condition. Make sure you have a good, bright, sunny location, mm -hmm. at least five or six hours of direct sun. They like a rich soil, so yeah. use that Maryfield planting mix. Uh, and then this is a good time to get started on there because you have a great selection. They just came in yesterday. I know. Look how healthy they look. That's great. Okay. Not well, exactly seed starting, but we wanted right. to get that in there. Same idea. You know, get started early. There you go. Right. Okay. We're going to uh, take your phone calls now. And our first caller is Richard, who's calling from Colesville. Hi, Richard. How are you today? Good morning, Debbie and David. Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Good. Oh, good to hear from you. My uh, comment this morning has got to be for David. He has put on a presentation 
for gardeners, whether they're novice or experienced, that everybody should. He, he's Richard. going to make me blush. I know, Richard, you I'm are the best. I'm already blushing. No, don't put the <laughs> camera on me. <laughs> no, that's very kind of you. Thank you. We, we hope to inspire some people with that. That'll be great. Yeah. Richard, thank you so much for the call, Richard. You are the best. Have a great weekend. Okay, do we have any other callers? Greg is calling. Uh, good morning, Greg. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Yourselves? Good, thanks. Uh, we're doing fine. Uh, who, whoever would like to answer this, uh, it's just a reconfirmation of azaleas. I fertilized them back after they bloomed, I believe which was in about mid-May, maybe late May. But the question is, do I re-fertilize them now before they bloom? Again, no. I have mature. They're like 15, 20 years old. Yeah. I would say no, because what happens, the growth cycle on azaleas is, uh, like I said, they flower, let's say, sometime in, in late April, May. After they bloom, they start their growth season. So then they're growing kind of May, June, July. By the end of July or August, they set their buds and stop growing for the year. So that's sometimes what we refer to as a determinate type of growth rate. You know, they go, th they right after flowering, they go through this big uh, growth spurt, and then they basically finish by late summer. So you want to time your fertilizer applications with the growth of the plant is when they can best utilize that. So I don't feel like there's really any advantage to fertilizing at this point in time. Uh, you'll do the same thing, of allow them to flower, and then fertilize them. Now just um, a little off on a tangent, but by, by contrast, let's say you have hollies. You know, hollies that start growing in April, and they grow April, May, June, July, August, you know, right up to the end of the year. Um, those you may want to fertilize as we start getting into uh, March, early April, as we approach the beginning of their growth season, but azaleas don't start till later. All right, now, uh, just a follow-up question since you mentioned a holly. Hemlock and holly, are, are they one of the same? And I have like a 16-foot holly, or hemlock, I should say, blue uh, red berry. You only, only can trim that back one-third by your status, because anything more might harm it. I mean, this thing's, I'm looking right at it, it's like 10 feet wide, 16 foot tall. Uh, I do want to trim that back, but only one third at a time, is that correct? Yeah, you need to be careful in trimming a hemlock. Uh, hemlocks, and, and right, hemlock stone is a needled evergreen, it's got a small flat needle, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, uh, hemlocks, couplings, one is, I mean, like we'd mentioned, they'll start growing in April, so this is a good time to go in and prune them and fertilize them. Uh, but with hemlocks, you need to keep your pruning out where the tissue is kind of soft and where there's green growth. If you cut way back, if you cut that severely, and you cut into the old woody growth where there's no vegetation, no um, leaf in there, that's not going to re-sprout. That's just gonna leave a bald spot that's in there. So the best way to prune them is really go out and do a little bit of shearing on the outer edges of the plant trim it, shear it, you can cut it back as far as the green growth occurs, but don't go beyond that point. So you're telling me it's pretty much going to stay about 14 to 12 feet tall now? Uh, I, can't, I can't take it down to like 10? Well, if, you, if you're what we call top it and cut it down to 10 feet tall, it's going to sort of permanently disfigure the plant. It's going to have a flat top rather than a nice conical shape to it, and then you have to decide if you can live with that. It's not going to kill the plant, but it's going to it's going to sort of ruin the form and shape of it. I see. Well, it doesn't have too much shape. It's pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, Thank and so you. sometimes hey, you got nothing to lose, long. right? So you might you might want to do that, but just know you only get one chance at it. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll study it and put it all together in my head, like you pre-cut, do that, and come up with some kind of a system. Thank all you. Right. Thank you, and good luck with it. Yeah. Thanks so much. Have a great day. We're going to take a quick break and come back with more of your phone calls. Stay tuned. Pretty flowers, pretty flowers. All right, let's get right back to our phone calls. Let's see, Joseph is calling from Pond Lake. Hi, Joseph. Where is Pond Lake? Pond Lake is in Pennsylvania uh, on route, off of Route 3. Great. Okay. Uh, going toward Culpeper. All right. 
Oh, okay. Glad and to hear that gave from me you. a little reference yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, I had never heard of Pond Lake before. Good. What's your Pond question? Lake, yeah. mm -hmm. The question is, is, of course, Pond Lake begins with, uh, starts with deer, and that's, of course, where uh, it's a uh, uh, gated community. Uh -huh. The question is, is that they let the deer run free when you walk out in your front morning or you drive to work and deer are just everywhere. Oh, wow. Right. What can you possibly, I mean, basically you have to wait and let them cross the street. Man. What can you possibly do to have a garden as well as, uh, you know, keep protect the deer? Because we go out in the morning and deer stand out there eating our, anything is green, they're, they're mm -hmm. out there eating it. Yeah, that, that's a, a problem many, many, many people uh, deal, have to deal with. You know, there's, um, you know, even I know in like Fairfax County, the deer population is so high and surrounding areas that we're, they're actually trying to reduce those populations. Uh, but basically, your, your options come down to the most effective is going to be fencing. Uh, but that requires a minimum of a seven foot tall fence and I realize that that's not practical for a lot of people. So uh, when fencing is not an option, then we start going towards the repellents. Um, of course, repellents, that's one more chore that you have. There's some very good ones. We found like Bobex and uh, Liquid Fence are two of our most reliable ones. And they'll last several weeks between applications, but that's just one more chore that you have to keep up with. Uh, and I would not spray any repellents directly on any food crops. And I'm saying because we've talked a little bit about vegetables today. If it's uh, vegetables or fruits, things that you're actually going to be ingesting, then there are other repellents, smell deterrents. Like there's um, the name of the company is called Sweeney's and they make an all season, which are these little capsules that you can put out around there. So there's a lot of different options out there as far as repellents go. And then wherever you can modify your landscape and using deer resistant plants, plants that are less favored to them, uh, that can also be helpful. So there's no easy answer. It's usually a combination of tactics. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay, and, and from time to time, we do offer classes on, on landscaping and gardening with mm -hmm. deer. I don't think we have them in our schedule yeah, right now, so. but, mm -hmm. but keep an eye on that because we do offer whole classes on that topic. Oh, okay, very good. Thanks so much okay. for the call. Enjoy your weekend. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank bye bye. You. Okay, let's see. Chick is calling from Dumfries. Hi, Chick. Hey, how you all doing? Good. How doing are you? Just fine. <laughs> fine, thank you. I enjoy your show. I get a lot of information from it. Oh, but, thank uh, you. I have a garden, a uh, small garden. Every year I mulch all my leaves very fine and cover my garden. Mm -hmm. I want to know, if is it possible that I can leave those leaves on and turn them over or rake them off and use them as a mulch after I plant my uh, garden? Uh, really, the choice is yours. I mean, all of the above is is a good gardening practice. If you uh, if you cultivate and work them into the soil, of course, you're adding organic matter to the soil, which is a good thing. Uh, basically, if if you want to leave them on there as a mulch and just plant straight through it, um, you can certainly do that. It's a good suitable mulch. I would say just my only caution is, you know, like anything, you can do too much of a good thing. Um, I recommend anywhere from one to two inch layer of mulch. Uh, I wouldn't want it to accumulate or build anything that's thicker than that. But another little thing I'm going to say is a lot of times there's this um, old wives tale I call it or talk out there that, that if you're leaving oak leaves in there it's going to make your soil more acidic. That's not really true. As they, any materials, those leaves are decomposing and breaking down, they come out to a slightly acidic uh, pH and that's not going to affect your garden. So it's, it's all positive, it's all good. Long answer to a simple question simple there, question. I guess. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, right. have a great day. Okay, let's see, Andy is calling from Kensington. Hi, Andy. Hi, how are you? Good, and Doing you? Doing fine. Good, thank you. Um, hey, I am considering planting bamboo as a screen. I'm looking, uh, I'm interested in learning about varieties that do not spread, but that grow well in this area. And the scenario is, is I have, this is for my backyard, I have a six and a half foot fence, but there's just certain spots where if you're in the backyard, you look out and you see the neighbor's house or you see a telephone pole and things like that. So, right. You know. Well, we do, we do offer a couple varieties of clump bamboo. Now, I don't know if we have them in stock this early in the season because it's kind of a specialty plant. And, of course, bamboo is a, a warm season grass. It doesn't really start growing till a little bit later in the, in the season. 
So I would um, suggest you give us a call at the Garden Center, and I would have you speak to, to Paul McLean. Uh, if you can give us a call, the phone number at the Fair Oak store where I work, it's 703 uh, 703- Nine six eight nine six eight nine six eight zero zero. I want to make sure I'm all three numbers are bouncing around. But if you give us a call at the Fair Oak store, maybe ask to speak with Paul McLean. He should be there this morning. He can tell you specifically the availability when they're coming in. I think we typically have a black one that's sort of a black stem variety, as well as one that's more of a green stem. Both that are clump formers. You want to put them in a area that's a little bit somewhat protected. Um, if it's real cold, exposed, windy location, uh, they can get beat up pretty bad in the winter time. But if you have a little shelter or buffer from the winds, it could be a good choice. Yeah, so they would be, you know, the first uh, six feet would be buffered by a fence, but the top portion, once it reaches that height, would, would, be, would be hit by wind. Yeah, then they probably would, you may risk getting some damage during the winter time or consider doing some protection on it. Does, it, does, it, does the bamboo recover, you know, over time from the, the, the winter? I mean, does it yes. recover quickly? Well, it's more of like a winter burn type of damage on it, so it's not fatal. And then as the temperatures warm up, because again, it doesn't really start growing till you get into May in the warmer temperatures, but then it would recover quickly um, as you go into the summer. We have run out of time. I'm, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for the call. Hope that uh, that helped. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for a great presentation. I, go have some fun with some seed starting. That's, that's the main thing. Have some fun. Next week, Peggy will be here, and we're going to be talking about sprucing up for spring. Just some, uh, some ideas to get ready. Have a great week. All right.